Hello, welcome back to the Podcast Producers Podcast with me, Neil Mossy. Hello, I'm not at the Happy Hut today. Today I am in beautiful Brighton. This isn't a fair representation. <laughs> with, with one of my closest friends, Gordon Lang from Camera Labs. Hello, Gordon. Hello, Neil. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. This feels very um, formal and stilted. We never uh, agreed to do this. I was just walking <laughs> home and he just caught up with me. It's the only way to book guests get on a train and and just hassle them in the street we're looking and what for, a lovely street it is yeah we're looking for somewhere nice to sit down which is ironic because for this episode i wanted to do as little editing as possible uh, but maybe good, lu- good luck with that <clears throat> you know the only problem with talking to you gordon is that i'm terrified of um my gear just not being up to the spec that you're used to it is quite daunting. Speaking yeah, because my, my productions are always such high quality. They are, they are. You've, um, you've got 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, no? 120. 120. So it's gone up by 20,000 in... A year. It was six <laughs> months that we've last spoken. You were last bragging about it, your... I got over 100,000 exactly a year ago. Uh-huh. It was in November last year. My YouTube partner manager, who's since left, yeah. was, uh, was confident... <laughs> it, would, it would be double that by now. And I, was, I confidently said to her, it would, certainly would not be since it took 12 years to get to 100,000. Yeah. It would not be taking <laughs> another year. She goes, yeah, but most creators do this. <laughs> yeah, not, not this one. That's so last century. <clears throat> you sure you don't want to angle that more so that we're both the same size? Yeah, okay. That has happened on the, the videos I've shot so far. Well, I'm tiny <laughs> in, it, in each one. That's a good visual gag. But, but I even managed to do it with the audio on the last one because um, the pro I was speaking to actually took off the dead kitten because we were indoors. And I thought, I'll keep mine on because I like the look of it. It's like a fashion brooch. Uh, but on the recording, he's booming and I'm, uh, I'm really? small in audio terms. It did seem to affect it. Maybe I'm just, it was because I was on introvert mode in my voice. Do you think the dead cat was absorbing your energy? Yes, in <laughs> my aura. <laughs> um, so we found a bench, like a couple of... Um, Hobos. I, I was going to use a nicer term, but yes, some itinerant uh, workers. Um, the, the idea of the Podcast Producers podcast is that podcast producers share their experiences to help anyone start their own podcast. Okay. And as you say, you've been doing it for donkey's years... I've known you since, it's probably this week, 28 years ago. <laughs> it was a house party. <laughs> oh, go on. And with a, all I remember is the wall of Molson Dry, oh, empty dear. bottles. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. Or was it Rolling Rock? Uh, no. Oh, yeah. I think I Molson, used to. Yeah. Oh, sad times. <laughs> I cherish Did you. I used to drink that stuff? <laughs> I was actually really obsessed with it. Also, when I used to come and visit yeah, you in yeah, Camden, yeah. it was like... We're not going to this bar unless it's got Molson Dry. Excuse me, bartender, barkeep, do you have Molson Dry? You did. Of course we do. It's a giant chain and everyone has it. Excellent. (laughs) Then we shall drink here. (laughs) Did you used to sketch the logo? I remember the logo being quite prominent uh, wherever you lived. Oh, dear. At the time. And you still talk to me? Yeah. Uh, Well, my God. Uh, Not not do I only just talk to you. Quit, it's the cops. Let's go. (laughs) (laughs) I'm in awe of your online presence. So the... The, the first person I wanted to talk to about this is, is you. We, we've sat ourselves in a sound <laughs> it effects is, it, factory. <laughs> <laughs> Which is ironic. Because it was so peaceful a minute ago. This was the one episode that I didn't want to edit, and I'm not going to. This is going to run long. Um, It'll be the TARDIS sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if the picture quality isn't good as yes. well. Yes. I'll just spot in shots on the YouTube version of this episode. I'll put in um, shots of my daughter's Lego friends. You could be Stephanie. Um, that I identify with Stephanie. I'll, I'll be Mia, I think. They are. I like the Lego <laughs> friends. What do you think about them not having standard Lego heads? It bothers me. Oh, no, but... Because um, they're not the, the spherical head. Absolutely. They can, they can-shaped head, are they? One might say that... Um, uh, it means that the, 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 these female characters have decided to do their own thing and not fit in <laughs> with the uh, rest of the system, which might be... You don't think they didn't want to be portrayed as a kind of chunkier, cam-shaped type character? That's true. Um, their heads are quite big as well, aren't Have they? you seen the Hagrid? No. The Hagrid is really giant, right? In, in Lego Friends 
shape or is Hagrid it minifigure? Is, Hagrid isn't part of Lego Friends. Okay. So it's a different it's a different <laughs> franchise. You might have heard of it. It's Mia's friend Her, down Harry at the stable. Porter. <laughs> but it turns out that it's all hair. And when you remove the hair, is it just Hagrid's got a normal sized head. Oh. It's just all hair and cape. So it's a, a giant um It's hair a giant plug. lie is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> what you want is a scaled up one. No, they, they do it like classic filming. We're, we're going to make him look big by filming him close up and everyone really far away. Which is what you were talking about a minute ago. Make your guests feel special. Yes. By making their voices boom. Yes. Their feet look large. And on the on the video version of this podcast, the, the other the, the other concern I've had is whether or not I should be sat on the left hand side or the right hand side. Uh, Why is there a dominant side? I, th- I think there is. I think, and I think on, on talk shows, I think they live and die by which way round the, the host sits. So the host is always on the left on TV. No, on British shows they're on the left, but on American shows they're on the right. Absolutely. Why is that? Well, well, is that a thing? I think it's a thing. I think, cause I, and I learned this while I was doing the stand-up course, that when you're thinking, you look to the left, and if you feel under pressure, you, uh, you eye flick to the right. So actually, the side that you're sitting on, you look like you are permanently uh, on edge. <laughs> Whereas I look uh, erudite. Of course, on the audio version, uh, none of this applies. But maybe I should put you on the left-hand channel uh, and maybe range me on the on the right. That, that could work. My mind is blown. <laughs> but it's true about the British talk show. Yeah, yeah. The, the interview was always on the left. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's weird because Wogan seemed to flip sides um, uh, and it, it just felt odd one, one way round. So that's something to look out for on, on talk shows. But, but this is something, maybe we're jumping ahead too fast because so, so the idea is that I talk to people who make podcasts to uh, find out what has worked for them, what, what hasn't worked for them. But there's this whole uh, arena, a uh, collective noun of podcasts that are also on YouTube mm. and they don't seem to have a there isn't a word for them. Mm. So, so I really like the James Altucher show and Jocko Willink, where th- there's an audio podcast, but you also have the video version. And you've, you've done that from the outset, haven't you? Yes, but not deliberately. I think it's out of laziness more than anything else. So the way that I... So a podcast, you could just talk by yourself. But the podcasts that I do are generally conversations with other people, like, like this one. But they're generally conversations with people over the internet using Skype or previously using Google Plus and those systems work very well for video and a few years ago they introduced a means by which you could record it or even broadcast it live as you were doing it to try and encourage people to put more content onto YouTube to to feed the beast. So a lot of people started recording video, still recording a show with the goal that audio was supposed to be the final goal so you wouldn't say so in my left hand I've got this and as you can see it does this because that's no good if you can't see it but before you know what's happened and then you've uploaded it to both an audio platform and a video platform with YouTube and you realize that because YouTube just just so many people watch it and can come across it and find it whereas finding podcasts is a lot harder you know it's difficult to do good SEO for a podcast but for a YouTube video it's very easy particularly when you remember that of course YouTube is owned by Google who are the king of search or the queen of search the leader of the emperor of search so they make sure that on search results a YouTube video always features very highly so if you want to get your stuff found YouTube is a good platform and of course YouTube also lets you monetize it yeah even if you're only making three cents a month it's three cents more than most people are doing by just making an audio podcast available yeah but that said I think there's a certain sort of laziness to it because you're either doing one thing or another and we're we're kind of mucking about doing a bit of video and a bit of audio and I prefer pure audio ones because it's like reading a book without pictures in it, Neil, where you you literally have to imagine the whole thing. And we were talking about Adam Buxton's podcast, which is one of my favourites, and he doesn't do a video version of that, even though he's fantastic on video, he loved his TV shows, but it's entirely audio and I don't know whether he's playing sound effects or whether he really is crunching through leaves in a you know but I imagine him walking through a leafy area like in fact we are here take that Adam Buxton we're <laughs> actually in a park you've jumped to the the first format points of the podcast producers podcast which uh, to get to know my guest I mean I, I've known Gordon um, for a hundred years but um, it's gone up he was 28 <laughs> the it feels like a hundred um, the um, 
So the first question is, without looking at your phone... Yes. Which, what time is it? Yeah, <laughs> where are we? a giant clock behind us. <laughs> which podcast do you check first and update to see if there are new episodes of? What's your favourite podcast? Well, again, I'm now going to put my foot in it and say that most of the podcasts or shows that I consume are via YouTube. So YouTube tells me, rather than me going out looking for them, it's generally other photographers. I'm a little bit boring like that. I want to kind of <laughs> want to see what they're doing. I want to see if they're doing it better or whether I'm, I've beaten them to some scoop or if they've got some new kind of production idea or a new way of marketing things. So I check a lot of the, uh, the, big, the bigger American uh, photography channels. Uh, there's a, a lovely couple called Tony and Chelsea Northrup. They do a lot of video podcasting, which I think is mostly consumed on video. Ted Forbes, another photographer. I think some videos also work well just as audio, because of course, just because it's on YouTube, you don't have to watch it. You could listen to it, yeah. or you could have it playing in the background and listen to it, and then turn and look at it when you think, oh, they're talking about something I'm interested in, and now I've got the video element. Yeah. So the guys, uh, Chris and Jordan, who used to do uh, the Camera Store TV, who are now members of DP Review, which is a, a really big photography review website, they do really, really nice videos, but a lot of the time I just, because I love hearing them, and they're, they're very, very funny people, so I, I just kind of listen to their show and then look at it when, you know, I know there's something interesting going on, which of course is most of the time. And then outside of that, the comedy, the comedy ones, most of, you know, like my favourite comedians and, and broadcasters, they, they have really nice podcasts. Not necessarily regular ones, but I think, as I mentioned earlier, Adam Buxton, I think, is one of, one of, one of my favourites. If you could choose one, so you've got limited bandwidth, you can only watch one right now, is there a podcast that you would jump to on YouTube or audio? Well, for enjoyment, I'd, I'd go to Adam's. Adam Buxton, yeah. 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 Love... The, others, the others are kind of more business, really. Sure, sure. I love yeah. the, uh, the jingles and the audio production. Oh, yeah, really, it's fantastic. Really lovely. And, and the fact that you wonder whether some of them, like the sponsorship, whether it's parodied or not, or whether it, it isn't, well, it's parodied, but it's still actual sponsorship. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's genius. And you know that if you do sponsor him, you know he's going to have some fun with it. So your brand's going to have to work with that. Yeah. And I think that's, that's great. Were, were the mattresses real? Who knows? But what is it with mattresses and podcasts, though? It's because that and Because <laughs> yeah, when you listen to most podcasts, you want to go to sleep. <laughs> because you consume them lying down. Yes. Or, you, or you, you bulk consume them, you binge on them. Like, when I first came across Adam Bugson, he was actually on a flight, a transatlantic flight, and uh, binged on about ten of them during the flight. You took them with you? No. It they were on part on the... of the in-flight uh, entertainment system, and... I often prefer that to watching, trying to watch a film on a little screen or when you're constantly being disturbed or, you know, I prefer listening to audio instead. What I love about your, I call them your community, your people, your, people. your uh, cabal of other podcasters in the world of uh, photography and uh, camera equipment uh, review, you all help each other out, don't you? I've seen clips of those. There's a lot of collaborations. Yeah. yeah, we. I think we all met with our uh, partner managers at YouTube at the same time, and they all went collaborations. That's the future. Do more of those. The idea, of course, being that you get their subscribers, they get your subscribers. You, you know, a bit of cross-channel promotion. Yeah. I don't. I've not actually found that it works that way. It's just more fun, really. The other thing that's really nice is that a lot of these creators on YouTube, because I first started on YouTube in 2006 when it first launched. I was the only person doing technical product reviews. Yeah. And if you look back, I mean, they're horrendous. Well, they're horrendous now, but they were truly awful, but there was no nothing else around. And then suddenly all these other people came along and started doing it way better, way better than I was doing it. And you, of course, go, who the hell does this person think they are? You know, what's their background? Are they proper trained journalists? Have they ever trod the boards, darling? Of course they haven't done it, but well, it doesn't matter. They're doing it better than you. They're getting a bigger audience. They're more fun. They're presenting the information in a, in a better way. But of course you hate them because they're beating you. And you build up this in, insane resentment. And then you actually meet them in real life. And of course, invariably, they're all really nice. Even the <laughs> really nice. So I've I've met most of them now, and they've all become friends. <laughs> Honestly, why do you podcast? Well, it sounds really accusatory. It's not. It's um, it's supposed to be exploratory. If you're listening to the audio version, he's pointing at me in a in a in a very mean. 
fashion. Um, it's a little passive aggressive, that. Yeah. Yeah. That's my start. That, that, that's, that's the start. angle I'm going for. I yeah. Think, on the series. Why? Well, here's the thing: is that you know, like most creators, you do what you want to do, and people come to it or don't. But interestingly, within the media, people will start to call it a thing. So you call it podcasting now, but we used to call them radio shows, or we used to call them, you know, a CD or a tape or mixtape. Or something like that. So it's, we've, we've created this content for decades and decades, um, video and audio content, but it's just we, we just call them podcasts now. Why do I do it? Well, what I do is to test cameras. I, I test cameras and I really want to find out how something works. I really want to get to the bottom of what makes it different, what makes it special, better than anything else, to see if the manufacturers, when they say, oh, it now does this and it does this, and you think, does it really, you know? And when you delve into it and look at it and start testing them, you realize that it's actually an enormous subject that you can just delve into deeper and deeper and deeper. I mean, it's an infinite warren of, of rabbit holes. It's, it's ridiculous, the degree of detail you can get into, and that just really turns me on. I love that degree of detail, and that's what arguably got me fired or made me unemployable in a corporate environment, because they go, well, well, we're going to fit you in that box in these constraints, which in the magazine world was, yeah, you can write whatever you want as long as it's 700 words, because that's a page and you're not going over that. If you do, we're going to cut it and we're not going to employ you again because you're making it hard for us to edit. If you're on radio where well, you've got half an hour or an hour and you've got to stop every 10 or 15 minutes if it's commercial. If you're on TV and so on, you know, it, you know there's, there's a reason why when you cut the adverts out, every TV show is 43 minutes or 52 minutes or whatever. And you begin to think, well, what if I want to make something that's an hour and five minutes? What if I want to make something that's three days long? There's, you know, the beauty of the internet is that we can do that. Whether people will want to watch or consume it is, a, is another thing. But that's one of the reasons I do podcasting and making the videos and writing the reviews is to, is it, it's an outlet for this desire to just ramble on which I've yeah. done now, I've rambled. Yeah, no, 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 it's, it's absolutely compelling because well, you touched on two things there. One is the gatekeeper, that, that someone should give you permission to, to, mm. to do what you really enjoy doing. And then, and then the second are these arbitrary constraints, whereas if you do go on for an hour and a half, you'll find the audience that likes hearing it for an hour and a half. You know, it's, it's uh, an infinite canvas. Mm. Uh, that's really exciting. And there's no money in it at the moment, which is what That's the most really exciting, exciting thing, <laughs> is that it's completely which non Which is why we live here, in this park. <laughs> yes. I'm just going to have a little rest now. Yeah. yeah, this is my home. But it's true, isn't it? There is, there is um, uh, calling is too uh, uh, dumb a word. There, no, it is. There's something no, beyond just doing it for, for the money. There's, there's something um, almost subversive in... You feel a need to express yourself. Well, it's a desire to be heard, isn't it? Obviously. You know, we all, yeah, we all want to feel that we're important and by producing a show of whatever, or producing content in which you're a part of it, yeah. you kind of like, it satisfies that, especially so if somebody, you know, gives you a like or says, oh, you know, you're not a complete idiot. Although, <laughs> the beauty of YouTube is that there are plenty of those yes. comments. Thumbs down on YouTube. Why do people thumbs down? What's wrong in just going, you know, I didn't really enjoy it. It wasn't my thing. I'll move on. No, I'm going to mark you down because YouTube pays attention to yes. this. And if you get thumbs down, yeah. it actually will show you to less people, especially that person and that person's friends and sure, connections. Sure. So when you thumbs down someone for whatever reason, if you genuinely hate it or hate them, yeah. sure. Yeah. But if it's like somebody the other day said to me, I, I did a video on how to choose the best vlogging camera. Yeah. And... I said, look, there's things that I look for in a vlogging camera. First, I indicated it with, with my finger. First, this. Second, with two fingers. And the comment was, he, he luckily didn't get to the third. He goes, I can't believe you held two fingers up to visually indicate the number two or your second point. So cliched, disliked and unsubscribed. Well, that's, that showed you. It, it did. <laughs> it's like... Really? You were subbed from someone because they did. I wasn't going, hey everyone, two two fingers. Sure, or sure. I didn't do it in a rude way. I did it in the polite way around. Yeah. What? You, and and the idea that it is actually kind of premeditated. You know, I, I'm really flying by the seat of my pants and everything. I, do, I haven't got time to plan. Yeah. What do you think? I need? I'm making it up, and I go. Uh, my, my second point is this. And that's what I did. And he took 
he took huge offence. But this is at why that. Right, this is why I wanted to start this podcast because because you like giving or receiving offence. Yeah, well, because that that, that kind of comment that in order to keep your series running, you need to have a resilience uh, against oh, yeah. that kind of um, and it, and it's really simple, which is let's see how many videos that person has made oh it's always none it's always when yeah. you always click on and yeah. you follow them and you track them down you look them up <laughs> on linkedin <laughs> they and um, then you realize mom they have none so it's it's good it's it's good that i have provided an outlet for that person to create their content on my comment feed <laughs> it, it i you've always, almost got to get to the point where you um something like that is a sign that you're doing exactly the right thing and that uh, for every comment like that, there are probably 20,000 people who enjoyed... Who like it. Yeah. And actually and say really nice things. On yeah. yeah. And or, or do say really nice things, but of course you don't concentrate on that. Yeah. And, you know, you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, you know, I used to be really sensitive and the trolls used to really get me down, but then I was on YouTube for a while and, you know, it made me really tough and resilient. And it doesn't, because it's the same way that if you're a, you know, if you're a, a fat and fit kid, which I was or still am, you, you know, at school, if your parents then go, right, let's get them in boxing training, <laughs> let's get them running miles, you know, and marathons, yeah. they, you know, they don't like it. Yeah. They hate it. It makes them feel worse. I should say that my, my parents didn't do that, so they just let me... Maybe they should have done. Maybe they should have done, and then I wouldn't be the lazy... Well, you say that, but then you wouldn't have the, the audio podcast, and you wouldn't have the video podcast, and you wouldn't have your site. So it was... Yeah, it was where are those thing. cool jocks now yeah. running their companies? <laughs> Leaving comments. It's, yeah, <laughs> internet millionaires. Um, the other interesting thing, though, Neil, is that both you and I, I think, come from, we can say, a journalistic background. We're properly trained, media trained. And who are these upstarts who think that they can come along with no training at all, putting content out without any sub-editors or without any producers, who the hell do they think they are? <laughs> Especially when they start doing it better and getting more likes. And I think, you know, I, I, I kind of bridge both worlds. You know, I started off as a, in inverted commas, a proper journalist yeah. on magazines and we were sent on legal training and how to handle yourself in interviews. So obviously, all of that has worn off now. <laughs> it's, there's no evidence of any of that training anymore. In the same way, there's no evidence of my O-level physics. So, you know, move on. But... So, the, so when, you, when, when you first kind of start seeing these other people, these usurpers come in, you're like, who the hell do they think they are? And then you think, well, actually, maybe I should learn from that. Um, <laughs> dog. Here's a dog. Hello, Hello doggy. How are you doing? One of my fans. <laughs> yeah. Like and subscribe, my friend. Like and subscribe. So at first you kind of really resent it. And then you think, well, actually, no. They, they are the future, so maybe I should be looking at that. And you do, so I kind of do a bit of, bit of both worlds. And, and occasionally I'll become old Gordon where I'm like, oh, how dare they, you know, they're beating me and where's the respect? Mm -hmm. And then there's the other part, which is me as new Gordon, where, where I'm going, oh, you know, these journalists are really backward and behind the times. You don't need a eight-man crew to be able to produce this content. And in fact, you, you know, you're running and gunning, you're faster, you're more, uh, more articulate when you, when you do it as a one- or two-man team, person team. So... In a way, it's good. And, you know, when you first start getting your bad comments on YouTube, if you're older, as I am, you may think, what happened to the good old days of TV where they were grateful for us putting out content and they couldn't comment on it apart from points of view? It was like, you can say something, but we're going to limit it to half an hour with somebody really acerbic who's going to make fun of you for daring to criticise the mighty broadcast channels. And that was it. But now... You know, with everybody being able to comment and tell you how ridiculous they think you look or how stupid you are, how stupid you and how sound. how bad your body language is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> then they're all you're, that you're holding two fingers up to indicate the number two. Maybe that is a good, it is a good thing. You know, it shocks you at first, but then you think, no, actually, this really, the do. trolls have mostly got a point. You know, when they say oh, you look like an idiot, you look at it and you think, yeah, you know what, I do look like an idiot. Maybe I should do something about that. Behind camera talent, but to use it as a as like an energy or a force to keep going is a is a good thing. I mean, I, I think our experience is uh, an impediment. Uh, that, that yes, it, it, because you know, and this is why I had to start this. I had to start this with literally a chat with the head of programmes at BBC England. I pulled my phone out and I recorded it on my phone with no microphone, just to get the thing started because yeah. I'd hit the podcast producer's wall 
on where you feel that you need to have a certain amount of gear yep. a certain amount of prep well let's go through this list you feel like you should have a good website yeah that should be a good web presence that you have a feed that works that you have cover art that yes. you're not embarrassed by that you have if you have guests that you have guests of a certain standard what else what else did you have to overcome production consistency which nobody cares about apart from you you know the, the producer the format of what your show covers and how it's structured in each episode because of our background we feel that we should have a distinct subject that we should stick to because people are following us or listening to us for a certain speciality or knowledge how dare we think we could even have an opinion on something else or an interesting something else but then that's interesting because when Adam Buxton again uh, interviews a musician and rather than a comedian I do sometimes think how dare he who does he think he is? If I want to hear an uh, interview with a musician, I'll go to a music journalist or a music enthusiast. So I'm, I'm guilty of it too. Yeah. It's, it's funny, is it? Because it's at that stage that you're following the, the host rather than the subject. Yeah, but there was that cult one there t- on TV interviews as well quite a long time ago, wasn't there? Yeah. Yeah. It's true. So I'll put the link to your podcast in the show description, description underneath this video if you're watching on YouTube and in the show notes on the audio podcast. How many episodes in are you at the moment? Well, if we're talking about, because of course you could just take the audio from any video and publish it as a podcast and that could be it. So I'm going to say on YouTube, I've done hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of videos some of which are deliberate podcasts as well, some of which aren't, but could be. In terms of what I've actually published on my podcast stream, not too many, maybe about 30 or 40. And they're generally, most of them are conversations that I have over Skype with a photographer friend of mine in San Francisco. This uh, called, is Doug. This is Doug Kay, who's uh, absolutely fantastic. Really fantastic voice, lovely guy. Fantastic face as well. It's not saying, you know, great, for, you know, great face for radio. He's really, he's really, really nice, and we just, have a, we just have a nice chat. It's an interesting community, the photography community, because I feel, although I'm not a member of a caravanning community or of a barbecuing community, so maybe they do it as well, but the photography community do meet up quite a lot. We do have, like, photo walks where we get together and we meet each other. We are quite happy to think that we're more important than we actually are and, and do shows where we all begin to interview each other and get to know each other that way as well. So I don't know whether many other hobbies do that, but the photographic community, especially in America, and I, I've talked to a lot of them there, you know, are very happy to do that. So we, we've been doing this for a while. And like when Google Plus as a social network launched, they, they launched it with, well, they didn't launch it from day one with this, but they added this feature called Hangouts. Yeah which is now kind of been and gone and spin off and is something else or maybe closed down. But at the time, it was, it was revolutionary. It was this way that you could, you could have a, a video phone call with more than one person, but also record it and broadcast it as a, as a show. And then they be, lots of little tools came up where you could uh, overlay like the name of your guest and where they were from and things to make it look like a professional show. And we were all like, great, we've always wanted to make our own TV show, so let's do that. And again, I don't know how many other communities were doing that you know model makers painters right, so already you'd be ahead gardeners because you'd have the gear to, to actually well there is that yeah it, because yeah. most of us would have cameras although we were using webcams inside a laptop most of the time most of us weren't using standalone cameras to do that but we were obviously familiar with and comfortable with visual mediums and if you're into cameras these days you're also into video and audio so you know we'd have decent mics and is that how you still run the podcast do you still do it as a google hangout no so we've moved on now because the thing the biggest the most important technical thing that i have found doing podcasting and, and videos is the most important thing of all actually is the audio it's not the picture it's the audio it's got to sound really really good and a good microphone in a quiet environment you, you can't beat, especially if it's close to your face, which is not necessarily ideal for video. That's why you see so many people with giant microphones in front of their faces. It doesn't look great, although it does look it quite does professional. Look cool, yeah. It does look cool, actually, doesn't it? <laughs> but it sounds great, and that's, that's the whole point. But what I realised is that even though, say, Doug and I were using really high-quality microphones, because the, the audio was going over the internet, it was being compressed by Skype or Google. It, it was good, but it wasn't as good as a local recording. Yeah. And we were also restricted by internet bandwidth. And if for some reason, because it's not a, a pipe of a fixed opening, 
it varies. So when you've both got great bandwidth, that's fine. But because we're recording at very different, very different time zones, sometimes it was busy for him or busy for me, and suddenly the bandwidth would reduce, the quality would fall apart. So what I've now started to do is actually record the audio and the video locally. And we only use the Skype or the Google Plus part literally to communicate with each other. That's so we can hear each other. We're not even looking at the camera that's in that call now. When it's our turn to speak, we look up at a proper camera locally and we film that, and it means you can film it in 1080 or 4K or really at a really nice bit rate. But more importantly, you've got that local audio with a decent microphone, and it, it's tremendous. It increases your production time, but it does look really good. So you've got to think, you know, how much effort do you want to put into your podcast? Are you producing so-called evergreen content, which is, you know, going to last for a long time? In which case, yeah, put the effort in. If it's just something, how is how I feel today or how I feel this week, if it's a weekly or a daily thing, then you can be a lot more casual. And I think it's very important to think if you are producing that sort of content, then make it fun, make it spontaneous. You know, let's go for a walk. You know, if we don't care about the noise around us, then yeah, let's go to, let's go to a park. Let's, let's, let's do it on bikes. Let's, you know, do something more fun with it, more dynamic, because it's only designed to last this week. But if you're gonna do something that you want people to listen to or watch five years down, like a proper tutorial, do it as well as you can. That's that's my that's my approach. Yeah, well, this is why I'm about uh, four four or five episodes in, and this is this is why I'm doing it like this. It's just to just to get up and running, and every muscle in my brain is going. This isn't this isn't correct. This isn't yet of the standard that I would have done the, professionally. The format or the technical standard. Both, both, and and on top of that, the uh, how the 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 home site looks and I haven't even started on the social presence yet uh, all I'm doing is just running so that I don't stop <laughs> and just to try and get as many episodes under the can into the can as possible because it's so easy to just hit, to hit that wall how how did you not hit the wall is it because you were working with someone else it's because I love the sound of my own voice <laughs> I just can't hear enough of it <laughs> No, seriously, but you don't no. need that on, online, though. This is the problem. It, the, the, yeah, but you raise your game. You, it does force you to raise your game. It's like, I remember years ago, so I'm a photographer, right? But I only show my pictures to my friends. And the moment, the first time you share a photo online to a public group, whether it's this week, last year, 10 years ago, it doesn't matter. You remember the first one you did because you agonised about it. For age, is it good enough to post? I'd show it to my friends, but would I show it to a stranger who is likely to go, you idiot, you know, it looks rubbish, you should have done it like this. So you think, you know what, I'm not going to post that because it isn't good enough. I'm going to post that because it is and I'm proud of it. And it does raise your game. Like I think as a photographer, I've become much better since I started sharing my pictures, much better. Also better at playing the game. You know what kind of pictures work well, are going to get more likes so you might end up taking more of those rather than the ones you actually want to take which you know is another conversation is that a good or a bad thing producing content that people want to consume as opposed to content that you want to produce but luckily there's a lot of crossover for me so it's not like oh my instagram is doing so well but i hate it it makes me feel so shallow but you know I, it, it's, it's going all right it's, mo it's mostly stuff i do but i do know when i post a certain type of image i know that that one's going to do well and this one isn't going to do so well, and you, you live with that. And it's the same for the podcasts and the reviews and the videos. You know, you pretty much know what's going to be popular. We were talking about this earlier, about how there's still this obsession, though, about maybe some hangover from an old job or an old career where you were expected to do something. No one's interested in it anymore. But because it defined you for so long, you feel you ought to do it. And you're doing the other thing as well that's massively more popular and successful and commercial. But for some reason... You're not concentrating on that, you're still doing the old stuff. And that plagues me and it takes up so much of my time. And I should, it's hard to let go because it's, it's all I know. Were you saying, this, this is an answer to a question you didn't ask, you asked, what keeps me going? Well, <laughs> as, as was evident, I said at the beginning, you know, that I love the sound of my own voice. I love, I love talking about stuff. I love finding out how things work and trying to get that across to someone. I want someone to, enthuse about it with me i want to be able to talk about some technology or some cool thing i've found and for someone else to go yeah that is pretty cool but more importantly you've explained it or demonstrated it in a way that i get i can see it you know because someone else was telling me about it last week and i just couldn't i didn't know how it worked or i couldn't picture it or what i'd use it for but if you think do you know what if i show it this way 
But if I talk about it this way, or if I film it this way, or record it this way, then people will get it. And that's really satisfying. And because I, I write and talk and film about technology, it's, it's an endlessly self-fulfilling subject. I mean, it's just, it never stops. Do you script your podcasts? How do you structure what you're going to record? Most of it. So I have, if I'm doing a video, if I'm doing a piece to camera, I'll write down some bullet points and I'll read them before I look to the camera. And then I'll, I'll do a take and it will be terrible or I'll fluff a line or it won't be good. So I'll just do it again and again and again and it will change. And eventually it will become one that you're happy with. And you're like, right, now I'll do my next bit. And that's how I would do, say, like a video review. Sometimes if I've got a massive amount of technical information to get across and I'm not facing the camera, I'll script it and read it out in a really nice kind of recording environment. When I say really nice, it's just one of my rooms at home that's got a lot of curtains, carpets, because a lot of my house is floorboards and very echoey, which sounds terrible. But if you've got a room that's really dead audio-wise, that really helps. You've got your nice microphone, no noise, get close to it. So I can script those. And sometimes the actual podcasts chats that I do with Doug are almost entirely off the top of my head, almost entirely ad lib. So you wouldn't even have bullet points to structure that conversation? A couple, but the thing is, is that when I do a review, so I'm not confident doing a podcast until I've finished my tests, at which point I will have completely immersed myself in that product or that subject for like two to four weeks, and I'll have lived and breathed it and done nothing else. And literally, you will know it back to front at that point. So if someone says, what does it do when you press that? You go, oh, well, it goes into the menu B where you'll find the setting to change the timer because you know it. And a week later, you'll have forgotten it all. So it's a very, I feel it's almost like, I feel knowledge or memories like, I imagine like this pyramid, this giant triangle with this very heavy and misbalanced, badly balanced knowledge wobbling like a giant brick on the top. And it will slide off, it will fall. But for a moment, it's there. Yeah. It's there. Tap into it, film your show, get it out, and then let it slide down one side <laughs> and smash, and never then, to be remembered again. Uh, but then you've got to sit through it all in the edit. So when you've taken yeah. 10 takes yeah. on one section, yeah. and, and it's because I've just been through this, it's soul-destroying going through five takes. No, it's not. You go through <laughs> it backwards. The same thing. You go through yeah. it backwards. Well, and you just grab You just grab. I take the, the last best. take. Yeah. Because the last, the, my last take is my best one. Because otherwise I wouldn't record it again. I'm not Stanley Kubrick. I'm not going to do multiple variations of something that's perfectly good. I haven't got time for that. I don't get paid for this. So, yeah, your last take is, your, is the one you're going to use. So what you do is you start at the end of your recording and you work backwards and then you're right, now I'm on, the, on that next subject. And then you cut it and then you ignore all of the ones which went wrong and then you, on to, and then you find the one. What I'll do is I'll leave a gap or I'll clap so that there's a spike, there's a visual clue that that's where I need to go to. And then I'll know that, that that's, the, that's the good take. So it's actually pretty quick to edit. No, you don't play through your bad ones. This is a glimpse into your psyche as well. <clears throat> so you've got the five takes and you've grabbed the last one. Yeah. Do you hold on to all of your recordings? No, it's too rushes? much. It's too big. So you I used to. it? I used to. What, what, so but um, you see, so now, Neil, so now I'm filming everything in 4K and the files are so immense that... Literally, I've got room for one project on my laptop at a time, whereas five years ago, I'd have ten, my 10 last projects. Now I need to do a project, clear it off completely, and then I need to archive it somewhere. So what I'll do is I'll render it at the best possible quality, and I'll just keep that. So I keep the edited version in good quality so that if I do need to use parts of it, I take it from that. No one notices. So you don't keep your rushes? Never. Not okay. now. There's too much of it. That's good. And do you... So you have, like, a reference version that you hoard? Yes. Because you don't trust that where you've put it up online, that, that, that might disappear. You've got a backup. Well, the interesting thing about doing the audio podcasting hosting, if you use a host like, say, Libsyn or whatever, they'll take an MP3 file at the file at which... the quality at which you upload it. So they're not, they're not modifying it, but YouTube and Vimeo will. You know, they, they modify it. Facebook, massively so. Um, so once you've uploaded it to them, they will render it in their own engines and it will be worse quality so that even if you then download it, which they don't always let you do, obviously, there are ways to do it, um, but if you then download it, it will bear no relation to the original. It won't look, it won't look anywhere near as good. So no, always definitely keep, keep the one, that, at least the one that you upload keep that one and do you keep one copy on a on a hard drive so i have um so <laughs> as a bit of a background 
when I first started in journalism, it was for a computer magazine, which I specialised on imaging for. So when digital cameras first came out, I said, hey, look, you know, I could review these because I'm a photographer and no one else wanted to do them. So I do printers, monitors, scanners, cameras, and, and, and imaging software, like the first versions of Photoshop. But it also meant I was still exposed to loads of IT stuff, loads of technical stuff. So I was very f familiar with drives, obviously, and servers. And um, what I use at home is a, a NAS, a network attached storage device, which is basically a server that allows you to store stuff. And you can configure them so you can put multiple drives in them so that if one drive breaks, then the other one's still got the data. It's mirrored, it's backed up, it, there's redundancy. So I've got a NAS where I, keep, where I keep everything, but of course the NAS isn't immune to fire, flood or theft. Someone could lift that, uh, steal it, it could burn down. So I have additional backups. So I have a uh, portable hard drive that I keep in a different house. A different house? Yeah, because what happens if your house burns down? Yeah. What are you going to do? I kept all my backups in the same room. You see, you're stuffed. It's got to be in a different location. You could use the cloud. The cloud, what we used to call the internet. Or what we used to call the ARPANET. <laughs> the cloud, the internet. You put it on that. With audio, it's easy because the files are small. But if you're doing a podcast and you're doing some decent production values, don't just keep an MP3 of it. Keep an uncompressed WAV version, you know, keep a, or at least a FLAC version so that you've got a good quality one that you can then do a lower quality version of for sharing. Those files aren't big. Yeah, so keep it in as many places as you can. You know, uh, keep lots of, lots of uh, duplicates of it. But most importantly of all, make sure one of them is off-site, whether it's in the cloud or at a friend's house. Are you, are you OK for time? Yeah. Yeah, oh, good. Yeah. I've got so many questions. These, these are brilliant. These tips are really handy, and they, they sound like they're pretty hard one. And point. some, yeah, and some of them, for example, Vimeo, if you're a Vimeo Pro, member which is about 50 bucks a year you can upload videos which of course have audio in them or audio files and it keeps an original version that you can download and i use it to provide sample videos for my reviews so i'll say look you know this new canon or nikon camera can film video here's how it looks and you can download it download the original clip so you can see exactly how it looks and it's it's they don't change it they don't compress it they do compressed versions for streaming or for downloading, but they also still keep the original version. So you could, in fact, use that as a backup as well. Flickr does that too for photos. It keeps an original version. If you've got the pro accounts, they keep original versions. It's a bit of a gamble because you're entrusting your backup to a third party that could go bust, that could change their terms and conditions. They could say, we're only going to do this now for $500 a year, or we're going to do it, but actually we didn't tell you that as of last year, we started compressing it. You may or may not notice or be affected by that but I always like to have an uncompressed or a mildly compressed version, especially for audio. And for your audio podcast, do you use a podcast hosting company? Yeah, so I use Libsyn, which I pay, 250, sorry, I pay $15 a month for, I think, 250 megabytes worth of storage, which is quite a lot of shows if it's just in audio format. Even my long rambly ones, you can upload in a decent quality. Um... Am I sensing that you feel slightly odd about? Well, using I do the because company? the thing the thing is is that the the podcast hosts are very good at giving you a completely compliant um, RSS feed, which then means the podcast aggregators like Apple and iTunes will go, "Yep, yeah, you're above board. I'll take you." And if your end goal is to appear on iTunes, which it is, it should be your end goal, then you want to make that as easy as possible. But there, there will be, I'm sure, cheaper and better solutions for that. The, the, the reason I'm sort of squinting and looking a little uncomfortable with it is that, so YouTube, if you are a YouTube partner and they pay you, they pay you a very, very small amount of money. I mean, you know, like about a dollar per thousand views. So you can work out what you need. And that's, that's in a, an area that I'm involved in, which is quite commercial. You know, photography, cameras, when people are buying a camera these days, they're spending a thousand pounds. So that's, that's quite valuable. If you're writing about cookery or gardening, maybe you're not getting a dollar per thousand. You might be getting 50 cents a thousand. You might be getting more. You know, it's difficult to tell and it does vary because it's biddable. But that's the sort of amount of money we're talking about. It's not much, but it's more than Libsyn pays me. In fact, I'm paying Libsyn to host, whereas I'm not paying YouTube to host which is why, again, what I mentioned earlier, so many people will upload onto YouTube because it's a way to monetize it. It's, it's free of charge and it's easily found. 
Do you think it's going to, just gazing into the future, because we're recording this at the end of 2018, I've got this gut feeling that um, there's a surge of podcasts happening or surge of interest in podcasts and the, 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 the area still hasn't got to the point where videos were with YouTube when actually there are so many of them pre-roll ads can now be a thing. Do, yeah. do you think that's going to happen with podcasts? Yeah, definitely. Eventually. Definitely. They need to be monetizable in some way. And people have, the only way you can do it is with sponsorship, which is basically getting your own pre-roll ads. Yeah. Either getting, either phoning someone up, becoming big enough that they phone you up, or going to an agency. And that's the nice thing again about YouTube is that it's all done for you. They take most of the money, but at least there is money involved. You know, they've worked it out and they, they now have, you know, ways that you can av uh, avoid advertising on YouTube by paying a subscription and they now have a Patreon type thing where you can donate to support people and a, a mechanism for you to provide bonus content. Stuff like that, you know, they're making it, they're making it possible, hard, it's hard, but they're making it possible to have a career or at least make a bit of money as a creator, whereas on the pure audio podcasting side, there, there isn't a platform for it. That, that you can monetize very easily unless you've got sponsorship, which is really hard. I mean, you're saying we're recording it towards the end of 2018 without ruining this video, audios, podcast chances, evergreen content. It's Black Friday. Everything's discounted today. And I I'm, I'm, did a post earlier where I said, um, here's my Black Friday deal. All of my content, all of my videos, the thousands of reviews that I've written, the millions of words I've written today, free of charge. Everything I've ever done, free of charge, and for every other day of the year as well. More fool me. <laughs> because it is. You know, so it's, it's sort of interesting that that's, that's my Black Friday deal. It's the same deal every day. It's, it's hard to make money from this. It is, but this comes back to the very first question, which is why do you podcast? I, I think there are because there's very little monetization, mm. there are other interesting reasons like wanting to prove eminence in a field or wanting to showcase, for instance, your podcast might make an audience member more likely to come to your well, that's the dream. Isn't it? That's the dream. Is that you, like so many things? Or by your book? Yeah, we which don't I'll put a link to in the description. None of us have got one job anymore we all have 10 jobs and and for any of them to be successful they should kind of feed off each other or promote each other so yes you're not making any money from your podcast but if you're talking as an expert on a subject and enough people follow you and appreciate you for that then that then you may be able to sell them a book or a workshop or something else but you need to build up the one to be able to do the other and I'm, I'm quite far down that route and it's still I have to say it's still not a fantastic career money wise but it's a fantastic career if you are a creator, to be able to create stuff you like is a fantastic way to spend your time. And I love that. I mean, that, that drives me massively. You know, don't get into this to become rich. You might do, but you probably won't. Get into it because you enjoy it. And also, no one's going to listen to your podcast or, or watch your videos if you're not passionate about something. I think you have to be passionate about it. But yeah, equally, and it is maybe a bit shallow, but what you've kind of brushed upon is very important to me, which is peer recognition and respect from other people, or also people in the industry. You kind of want them to be talking about you behind your back going, did you see what Gordon did? It was really good. Damn it, he's so much better than I am. <laughs> I wish I was as good as he was. And so good looking too, you wouldn't believe he's 70 years old. But his body language on the number two is appalling. Yeah. I unsubbed and disliked him for that. I hope he doesn't realise it was me. When you record your podcast episode, do you post-produce it in terms of EQ no. and compression? No, because I already sound fantastic. <laughs> no, because I've got a really high-pitched voice that you can't do anything with. It doesn't respond to EQ. Okay. It's like a photo where you, I'll just turn the brightness. Why isn't it getting brighter? But My I... voice doesn't... I've got a terrible voice for audio and it doesn't respond well. But the best thing I can do, EQ-wise, is to do it in camera, in recording, because this is my, my philosophy, as you know, about photography, is not to do any post-processing. I try and get the result I want as I take the picture, and the same applies for video and audio. I want to get it in the camera or in the recording. So if I want to sound boomy, bassier, nicer, I'll just get closer to the microphone. 
and I know that when I'm recording at home um, in my quiet room, the microphone that I use, I'm very familiar with how it sounds, how I should use it, how I should talk to it, how I should present to it, um, distance-wise, volume-wise, recording level-wise, what I can do, and I really, I'm very pleased with the sound of those. Because some podcasts, they have that um, heavily compressed radio sound, but you're saying if you use, uh, what, what microphone do you use? Well, yeah, it's interesting you say, I actually did a uh, video, which your viewers and listeners may find interesting, it was comparing two of the most popular microphones for podcasting, both from this Australian microphone company, Rode, everyone uses Rode microphones, they're really nice. But they do a million different microphones, so which one should you get? And a lot of them are USB microphones, so they're designed to be plugged into a computer. You don't need a sound card or an XLR jack or power or anything. It all comes off the USB. And they're designed specifically for podcasting because it goes straight into your computer, which is what you're using to record it and broadcast it. So they're USB mics. I tested the uh, Rode Podcaster, which is a USB version of the Procaster, which is an XLR mic. That looks like your, your archetypal radio presenter's microphone that's designed to go on a boom arm, on an angle poise arm, that goes right in front of your face, <clears throat> coming up next, that sort of microphone. And it's very compressed. Um, and the sound is very radio broadcaster type. Then there's the NT-USB, which is more for recording music of uh, spoken vocals, like audio books, or if you're singing. So it's more full range, full frequency response. Uh, so it's not coloured at all, and it's extremely accurate. That's what I use, which goes against what I said earlier, which is that because I don't have a very bassy, deep voice, maybe I should be using the compressed one, but I find I sound better on the more accurate one. I've got both of them, and you can hear them, you know, uh, on, on that video, and you compare, compare them and see, see what you think. But you prefer the, the more natural... I prefer the, the cleaner, because I'm also a hi-fi nut as well, and to me, I prefer something that sounds accurate. And that NT-USB, I love that microphone. There's some really good deals on it as well. It also responds well to being on a tripod or a mini tabletop tripod, which is what I normally have on me. Whereas the podcaster, you can put it on a tripod, you can handhold it, but really it's a microphone that wants to go in a shop mount on an angle poise, which, which says screw to, studio, which is screwed to a desk. Table. Yeah, it's, it's a studio mic. Whereas the NT-USB, you know, you could take it away with you. And I have recorded with it in hotel rooms and I have taken it away with me. Do you record the video separately then? So you don't squirt the microphone into the camera? No, you because it's a USB separate. microphone. Yeah. So the cameras have got 3.5 mil analog jacks. So they don't have a digital USB. They have got USB jacks on them, but not for input, not for inputting sound. I wish they did, but they don't. Um, I suggest that to the company. So why don't you do that? That could be quite fun. They're like, what? What? Uh, so what I'll generally do, generally do, is I need to synchronise the sound from the camera and the microphone. Now, if you're recording a Skype conversation or a Hangout, it's easily, it's already synced because you've chosen that microphone as your sound source, you know, in your preferences on your computer. So it's already syn synchronised that. That's no problem. But if you're using a separate camera and the mic's not plugged into it, you need to sync it. So you do a clapperboard, and I just clap three yes. times at the beginning, obviously once they've both started recording, and you line those up in your editing software later at high magnification, you nudge one back and forth until they line up, you mute that one and you keep the good one going, and it, it, it's in sync for the rest. It takes a few seconds. Oh, Gordon, I've got so much I want to ask you. This is brilliant. Um, do you prefer sitting up? Sit standing up or sitting down? Because this is something I've heard. So, for broadcasting, yeah. I sit down. Okay. I sit down, but if I'm on the phone, I stand up. And if I'm interviewing someone on the phone, I stand up. Because, yeah, you, you feel stronger, don't yeah, you? Yeah, you have more attack, you have more freedom, you know, just in terms of your performance level. This is the weird thing. I, I worked for a, a branded content agency who were used to working in print. And it, it was a shock to them when they started making video and audio content because what you're actually capturing is an actual performance mm. as much as the informational content you're actually capturing in real time a human giving a performance and it's very difficult to you know in a, if a photo doesn't work out very well you can uh, touch it up with some software or uh, if the words 
if you need to lop a hundred words off, that's that's fine. But with a with a performance, you need to actually get the person in a real location, in sync with the equipment. Mm. So the equipment's got to work. You you can't uh, tweak or fix it as easily afterwards. And that's kind of what's exciting about podcasts is that there is an authentic, a real life event has happened that you're that you're capturing. I would also suggest technically to use the same microphones as well because if the sound changes it's the same reason why people grade uh, the video footage which is where, where you colour it to try and match different cameras because when you go from one camera to another camera and the colours look different you're like now if you don't do any filming you won't realise this because you think well it's in colour I've yeah. set the colour I've, I've set, set it's either black and white or colour <laughs> yeah. two colour cameras start recording and you look at them you're like oh my god they look completely different you know forgetting about lenses coverage um, sensor size depth of field noise dynamic range forget about all of that and you shouldn't forget about any of that but just putting that to the side red doesn't look red on the other one and let's say you're both on a you're both talking in front of grass as we're doing let's say we've got two cameras one on you and one on me we've got the grass behind it when we cut from you to me and back again if that colour grass changes people are going to see it and they'll go why is that dark green and why is it going light and dark green I'm really distracted and it's just stuff like that and the same applies to audio it's got to be the same the same microphone the same levels same volume you do all of your audio editing in video editing yes software. I do all in Premiere Adobe Premiere is and you have always done that and you always will yeah because it may not be the best tool for doing audio you'd use I think Adobe do an audio I don't even know what it's called I think it's Audition but they do one that is specifically for audio but Premiere is what I know because I use it for editing video and invariably a lot of my audio content has a video element to it so yeah and you can export as an audio file from there so yeah you can export as mp3 or WAV or FLAC and once you've put your episode out there do you keep an eye on how the audio podcast is doing in terms of downloads yeah in terms of stats traffic. yeah lip sync lip sync does that for you yeah they, they yeah they they provide uh, some statistics for you not as much as youtube actually gives you youtube gives you a ton of stats does that affect what you do uh do you know you can be driven by results like that and analysis but you can spend a long time trying to find a trend only to find that it, it was just coincidence. It's interesting, but if you could apply it to something, something in the future, so much of what I do when I post stuff, this is the interesting thing about podcasts. Now, you see, a lot of what I post, say a review, a written review, or a photo on Instagram, even, believe it or not, is very, the success of it very, can, can be highly influenced by the exact time that you post it, the exact time of day and day of the week, particularly in terms of the US audience. Like for me, because I've got a, a lot of people who follow me in the US, and that's where a lot of my market is, there's no point in me posting something at 11 o'clock in the morning in the UK, because they're not going to see it. By the time they wake up, that content is eight, year, eight, uh, eight hours old and is certainly not going to be at the top of their streams. So you need to post something when your viewers or listeners are listening. The beautiful thing about podcasts is that most people subscribe to a feed and are, and are told when there's a new one. So it's not so time dependent. But for the other things, especially on YouTube, when you release a video on YouTube, is, can, be, can really impact it. So I, I look at the stats for that and you have best times for different types of content you know a Wednesday afternoon might be good for this a Sunday morning could be disastrous for one thing but good for another Friday night Saturday it's, weekends are terrible for written content um, even though people say they love settling down with a newspaper on a Sunday so they're obviously in the mindset of a long read as the Guardian would call it but they don't want to read one of my long articles on a Sunday but they will on a Monday but so it's disastrous to post any of my reviews over the weekend but YouTube doesn't seem to care YouTube does, can do well at the weekend. So I won't hold something back. If I finish something on Friday night, if it's a big written review, there's no way I'm going to publish it on Friday night. It'd be disastrous. But if it's a YouTube video, you post it when it's ready. It, Get it out there. Because it starts gaining Google juice. Yes. Yeah. And, and people drill back. If they, if they discover your feed and they like you, they do start to drill back yeah the other the other way to to get a, a a lot of traffic as well and this is this applies for images as well as for audio and videos try and get on other people's playlists well not playlists 
hashtags and things like people follow hashtags say on Instagram so if you tag your photo park or Brighton or whatever people will be following some of those hashtags and they'll they'll start liking your content they might not follow you but they will engage with you which is you know still worth something if you had to isolate it what is your favorite aspect of making the podcast which feeling part? important <laughs> but the bit I enjoy most I think bizarrely is and I like all of it but I really like editing I really like snipping out or deliberately making you leaving. sound really good and you guess sound <laughs> yes, like a complete idiot right, yeah. resizing if I, me in if, I, the yeah, if I sound like a complete idiot I was actually <laughs> really I was sublime really erudite just really articulate so if I sound like a in this it's, uh, it's Neil that's, that's done right. that it just happens to have that filter on it's, no is there is there a, a part of the process that you get a really big kick from yeah when you when you get something across well what I was talking to about earlier when you're trying to get across a piece of information like you're asking me questions and I don't feel that I've answered many of them very well but if I'd had I'd be like yeah, I'm really glad I said that I got that point across or I, I, I described it well I get a lot out of that and if it's technically good, you know, if, if, you, if you look at it and you're like, yeah, I wanted to show that or say that, and it, I, I managed it, I nailed it. So I enjoyed that, that part of it. And you know it when you're doing it, and you feel good, you feel good about it. The editing process, I feel I resent it a lot of the time, <laughs> actually. And that's the other nice thing about doing it as a hangout, is that you try and record it as if it were live. You know, you make a mistake, just keep going. I mean, I did so much cheap TV when I was younger, where people would say... I'd say it's not live. They say it might as well be because we ain't stopping. Gordon, you're very self-effacing. I think you are really good at this. Oh, well. You are really, but you, you are because you're so driven by the, the process. You're so driven. So, so you're into your subject, which is high-end photography yeah. and yeah. gadgets. Yeah. But beyond that, you've, you've got this real, you've got this thing in your head that you, you've, I think you feel this need to want to explain it to other people and to want to help other people mm. navigate their way through it because they haven't had the time or the inclination to drill into the subject as, as deeply as possible. And it, I don't know, it's just, it's just a really exciting time at the moment, isn't it? I mean, I, it's, it's Well, it's terrifying. Black Friday, it's very it's exciting. <laughs> Is there a more it's exciting sunset. day? It's gonna <laughs> sunset, it's gonna kick off. <laughs> but isn't it, isn't it brilliant? Because when we started, Everything was so gated. Everything was so yeah. locked down. And you yeah, just so, put something up on a Friday night because yeah. you feel like it. Yeah. Is, that's pretty cool. Well, it's it? extremely liberating for us because, as you say, we're old enough to remember when that wasn't the case. That if you wanted to... So I remember meeting Neil, remember meeting you in the third and first person at the radio station right, was, at uh, our university yeah. and I thought so Neil's a bit younger than me and I remember going in I wasn't I was only doing like one show a week and Neil was there all the time and so I thought you know he's like one of the pros and he seems to know what he's doing and I was I was in awe of you well you I was know, in awe of you guy. because of Michael and you Gordon's guys. nut huts <laughs> uh, one, of the, one of the best uh, radio shows on UKC radio 999 kilohertz well that's when I realised so my best friend Mike uh, at university he had a radio voice and I didn't have, I've never had a radio voice. And I've done radio with some people or TV. And st- suddenly, as soon as they're like, so they'll be going, oh, hello. And uh, well, no, they'll, they'll be like, oh, I was uh, shopping today. And, uh, and they'll go, oh, we're going live. Okay, three, two, one. Hi, everyone. And you'll be like, what? <laughs> what, is, what on earth is going on? <laughs> and it really, you know, you're, you're like, you completely knocked off balance because they've got radio voice. So Mike had a brilliant radio voice. He had a good normal voice as well. Um, so I met Neil at the radio station, met you at the radio station, and university radio or university magazines, newspapers, were the kind of accessible means of broadcasting, of writing, of, of investigating journalism, of actually trying to put content out there that you thought was of a certain standard. And then as soon as you left university and you didn't have access to the radio station or of the university magazine or newspaper anymore, you were like, well, I quite fancy that. How do I get into it? And in the early 90s, when I was thrust upon the professional world, well, you worked for the BBC or you worked for ITN or you worked for, you know, you worked for a proper massive media company, Sky. Uh, and guess what? They don't have a great deal of jobs. And guess what? Everyone wants them. Or MTV, you know, that sort of thing. You know, I'm going to talk about, I want to talk about videos, music videos. Really? Good luck. 
because there's only two jobs and there's 10 million people wanting them. And that was it. You know, media jobs were really, really hard. And like you say, you, you know, you had to go to one of these massive companies and they knew that they had lots of people after them. Fantastic if you managed to do it, you managed to do it. I kind of freelanced a bit for some of them and it was, you felt incredibly special doing it, you know, to go to somewhere like TV Centre, BBC TV Centre was such a thrill. Yeah. But then now, like 10 years after that, being able to just do it yourself is phenomenal. And I would always say this to people, so I started off on magazines and, and as I became more senior in that role, I started interviewing people for jobs. And I'd say to them, so you want to be a journalist? And they'd say, yeah. i say, oh, so what have you done about that so far? And they went, well, I'm here. You say, so have you done any journalism yet? They said, no, no, this would be my first job. I said, well, you could be a journalist without doing it for a job. Why don't you just find something out and write it down or record it? And they'd go, they'd look at you like you're, like you're from outer space. And nowadays, when there is an outlook, because there wasn't the internet then, or not as easy to get on the internet, but you could still put together. I put together a magazine when I was 10 years old at school about video games and used to sell it for 5p to my mates. And I used to handwrite everyone. I used to do screenshots. I used to draw them and colour them in with felt pens, you know, and, uh, and sell it. So I was a journalist then. I was producing content. And that's what I want to see from people, you know, when they're going for jobs. And people now say, oh, I want to, I want to get into broadcasting or I want, to, I want to have a podcast. Like you found, you can get so caught up in, oh, am I good enough? Have I got the right gear? For God's sake, just start doing it. Do it badly. That's how, that's how you get good at doing something. Yeah. You do it a lot. Yeah. Just do it as much as you can. You will get way better. Don't go on a course, unless it's one of mine. <laughs> uh, fully available at camelabs.com. Uh, well, do go on a course if you want, but it's not going to make you, you know, just start doing it. If you want to become a journalist, just start being a journalist. If you want to be a broadcaster, just start broadcasting. And then the day that you do, you are approached by the BBC or a job appears and they say, so, you know, what have you been doing? You go, well, for the past five years, I've actually had this really successful YouTube channel or whatever. They'll be impressed. At that point, you might actually be making some money from it. You might not even need that other job. So, yeah, just just do it, you know, in the classic words of that sports uh, apparel manufacturer. That's exactly why I started the Podcast Producers podcast. Uh, even if you haven't started one yet, you are a podcast producer. And so thank you so much for sharing uh, the inner world of cameralabs.com. Almost as a metaphor, the sun is setting. <laughs> on my career. <laughs> on our careers. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you now, kids. What... Um, if you had to title this episode, how, where would you start? How would you... Uh, because I suppose the titles of your podcast episodes are quite uh, are linked to the... The one with the, the two product. grumpy old men. <laughs> and a Nikon. <laughs> um, how would you... How, how, where would I start with titling this episode? Well, for SEO. It, yeah, no, or even just if you're sort of scrolling Top seven through. tips for podcasting success. <laughs> yeah, that was the last It can episode. never be ten. Have you noticed that? Yeah, well, well apparently... You can't have t- ten top tips now. The search engines seven. filter that out. Yeah. Seven. Um, all right. Seven best <laughs> podcasting tips by industry veterans. Now, as they sound old, I want to hear from a veteran. Not, an inter- not a podcasting veteran. Seven facts about Gordon Lang... You Seven habits of highly effective podcasters. That's the one. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> what do podcast producers do? <laughs> podcast producers podcast. Cue my daughter. Can you please help my daddy get 1,000 subscribers? Just click on his face. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>